You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. Welcome to Social Europe Podcast. I'm here with Adam Tooze, who is Professor of History at Columbia University and the author of most recently, Crashed. Welcome, Adam. Hi. Our first question is related to the Eurozone and the Euro crisis in more yeah. general terms. Today, Angela Merkel enjoys a very good reputation as one of the last strongholds of liberal democracy in the Western world. What is your assessment of that reputation against the background of her particular management in the Euro crisis? Yes, I think this is the big question mark about Angela Merkel as a putative hegemon, a liberal hegemon, is that the German uh, role in the Eurozone crisis is such an ambiguous one. I, I'm not personally persuaded that you know the, the best analytic, the best way of thinking about the Eurozone crisis is some sort of German project of domination. I find that extremely unconvincing. But the role that Germany played was that essentially of a veto player, setting conditions, setting high bars, Germany, after all, is an extremely high-functioning political system and a successful political economy, insisting basically that the rest of Europe rise to the challenge of implementing some local version of Hartz fear, mm. uh, price stability, and then the debt break of 2009. And that's kind of all, really. Beyond that, it's a series of concessions made to necessity and more uh, adventurous, imaginative programs Provide, uh, suggested by, by suggested by other players in the eurozone drama, and I think that's a pretty poor record, really, for somebody who is now credited with the potential as a as a leader of the you know, the liberal West. A society like Germany that relies so heavily on a gigantic trade surplus is not one that is contributing powerfully to the viability of of that system. Uh, it's one that's reliant on it and takes it for granted and is willing to argue for it, but is in fact materially uh, dependent on it and dependent on other people's demand, to put it crudely in macroeconomic terms. Of course, the Germans recycle, recycle their surplus and then lend, mm -hmm. but then there's no, it seems to me, concerted vision of how that lending mm -hmm. will be made safe or mm -hmm. how it will yield the return that Germany expects. So it's a kind of incomplete strategy and inconsistent strategy and certainly not comparable to that of the United States after 1945 or Britain in the heyday of late 19th century liberal empire. Mm. Since last year of the fall, we have a new German government, again with the Social Democrats, and the new German finance minister, Olaf Scholz, now famously said when asked what he would do differently from Wolfgang Schäuble, I think here in the United States, he said nothing. Um, so do you think the real problem of German European politics is actually the German left? Well, I mean, I, if one looks around for leadership in the German political scene, the, the SPD is the great question mark, I think, fundamentally. An opportunity uh, for, for positive sum games, uh, why you know, a project for social Europe adequately funded is not something that is attractive to the German left. I, I would agree that um, there's a severe impasse in Europe's politics and Europe's political economy. Germany is the veto player. Mm -hmm. Within the German political spectrum, the one party that one would see as being, you know, having some room for manoeuvre and ideological flexibility, ideally at least in one's imagination, would be the SPD. And unfortunately, across two grand coalitions, despite some energetic talk when they were in opposition in the second Merkel government about eurobonds and so on, that pro-European, adventurous, risk-taking kind of strategy is not material. So you could say that today European economies are doing quite well, first and foremost, the German economy. You also had a debate with Wolfgang Strake, who was arguing, you know, we should actually not have more of European integration, but much less. We should go back to the nation state as the primary regulatory force of politics, if you wish. What do you say to that? Why do you think that will not be enough? And why do you think it will not be enough to prevent another euro crisis from happening? Well, I mean, the, the simple answer as to why the, the move back towards, I think, national policies um, is not attractive is simply the situation of Europe before. I mean, I'm a historian. I don't think that the Eurozone project happened by accident or it was some political whim. It was driven by very compelling forces, above all, the real balance of power in a situation in which Europe doesn't have a currency mm. union. 
which is one that does fundamentally favour the Germany and gives the Bundesbank in particular huge leverage over mm. everyone else's economic policy. So this idea of returning to national sovereignty in the name of flexibility is, you know, is a very partial account of the kind of world that you end up with. And that's mm. the old world, not the one that we would perhaps yeah. be in now. Mm. And so from that, it follows to me that, you know, that, that this policy of needing to move forward, in fact, simply follows from, it's, it's a realistic account of the, the forces that are in play in the European economy, which in fact now operate, I think, largely you know, at the regional level, in the sense that the divisions and partitions within the European economies, each one of them, Germany, uh, France, Spain, Italy, are so large that what we need to be thinking about is a Europe of, you know, by all means, a Europe of patchworks, but it's a patchworks of regions which need to be articulated at the supranational level. And we have the framework, we have mm. the political institutions mm. either, and it is a question of filling them with life mm. and filling them with substance. Mm. The ECB, like it or not, has been an extremely powerful unitary actor. It, mm. it, by means of quantitative easing since 2015, it has transformed the dynamic in the Eurozone bond market. Mm. And that's an illustration of what an appropriately proportioned European economic policy ought to look like. And what we need is fiscal tools of a similar scale. And we need a banking union adequately backstopped as well. Once we have those in place, the EU is a huge economic unit with vibrant political scene and ought to be a major and important part of the, the global economy and the global political economy. I think you said recently in one of your interviews that democracy in Europe actually depends on a more social Europe. Can you describe to our listeners what you mean with that? Well, I mean, I think what we need to decide is the question of whether or not we want to have Europe-wide macroeconomic stabilizers. I mean, this is fundamentally, you know, one obvious move will be towards a Europe-wide unemployment benefit system. I, mean, I don't think this is a, you know, a technical mystery. It's obvious how you would move there. It, it's, a, it's a system that will operate largely silently. Uh, it operates within the United States, for instance, transferring resources on quite a large scale. It need not be massively politicized, but it does require an initial decision to do that. And But those kind of steps towards uh, collective solutions that operate across the entire territory of the EU, that are sensitive and reactive to regional differences, and that strengthen uh, the ability of the Eurozone and the EU to respond to shocks through collective rather than national mechanisms would seem to be the way forward. That that requires some political salesmanship and that it requires political bravery and political initiative and creativity is obvious. But that is, you know, without that, we don't have democracy either. Democracy is not just a matter of structural forces. It's a matter of agency. And so this is a question for the political class and for political parties. And it also, I think, requires uh, scholars like you who are uh inform the debate with new ideas and push policymakers and the public on, on the right and hopefully the right decisions to make. I can't remember ever a European election being as eagerly and seriously mm. anticipated as the ones next year. Okay. And this is a trend which we have seen going back to 2014. Mm. And you know, though, I, you know, though the, the politics of the Eurozone crisis were bruising and painful, and basically the Conservatives won, which I think is what many liberals and left-wingers mean when mm. they say that Europe's suffering a crisis of democracy. What they really mean is the other side is better at winning. Mm. And when it does win, it plays the game of power very ruthlessly. Mm. But through that process, it seems to me a polity has come into existence. I mean, we all care about what happens in each other's national elections. It really, really matters. Across Europe, how Bavaria votes. Because we everyone is watching to see how the AFD does. The, the question of whether Macron would win was a European preoccupation. The entirety of Europe, I don't know whether Germany noticed, but the entirety of Europe was waiting for Germany to form a government. That, by this point... You know, we, we, political scientists will endlessly say there's no polity in Europe. but And I kind of think we have a polity and we're waiting for people to actually perhaps popularize it as, you know, we very successfully have popularized the European Champions League or something like that. The, it is capable. It is perfectly possible to think Europe politically at this moment. Yeah. And if we endow it with more resource, it'll become all the more salient. You know, once the budget gets to be a significant size, people will really start caring. On that hopeful note, we will end this podcast. Thank you very much, Adam Tews. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu 
and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. 